I'm going to talk to you about a computational approach to game theory. This uh, arose out of a class that I taught at Milwaukee School of Engineering, where I'm an adjunct professor. And I uh, convinced the, the department that they should learn, um, they should have a course on Wolfram, that they should have a course on uh, game theory, and they should have a course on uh, dynamic game theory. And I was the person to teach that course. And they said that would be great. Um, they gave me an elective course, and I had software engineering, electrical engineering, and computer engineering students. So they were, it was quite a mix. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I set the course up. First of all, uh, Milwaukee is on a quarter system. And so the course was a one quarter, 10 week course. So um, I'll sh these were uh, the course goals. Um, it's an accredited program at Milwaukee School of Engineering. So they're all into saying what, what are the course outcomes. So you have to say, say pretty clearly. So by the end of the course, I wanted them to be proficient in computer computational engineering using Mathematica. I wanted them to be able to understand dynamic thinking how to apply systems thinking, uh, get the basic concepts of the theory of games, basic concepts of how you go beyond systems thinking and apply it to a dynamic theory of games, and um, then know at least how to, to build a simple one-person game, two-person game, and uh, we never got to three-person, but uh, if they got this far, they would, should be in pretty good shape. So I would hope that they would understand some advanced concepts and at the end, I hope that they could actually apply this in, in the real world. The course was built around using Mathematica notebooks. And I gave uh, labs, homeworks, midterms, and a final, all using uh, a, a Mathematica notebooks. So um, we, we went back and forth between Mathematica and game theory. So I started them off with um, basic hello world problem. And remember, I have this, this disparate group of people. So they, they have different uh, skills and things that they know. But basic hello world, arithmetic lists and plots was, was something they could all understand and actually ma made sure that they understood how to use a, a notebook. Then I gave them a simple game theory example. and We built this up in pieces. By the way, this is the notebook I have here is an example of the end notebook. It's not they didn't get this whole thing all at once, but it was built incrementally. So you're seeing the final product. Then I went back to lists and images. Um, and then uh, lab four was kind of was a key lab because solvers helped me distinguish between different uh, disciplines that I had. So for example, people that knew how to do solve were primarily uh, computer engineers, because they did a lot of circuit problems. And they were always faced with solving you know, five equations and five unknowns that were basically linear in it. So this was a big help, so they could identify with that. Our solve was very useful for the software engineers, who uh, in their algorithms course always tried to figure out how long it would take an algorithm to, to compute a particular kind of problem. And so there's recurrence solutions. And DSOLVE was very useful for the electrical engineers because they had some remnant of thinking about uh, differential equations. Then uh, homework five, and by the way, these five, one, two, three, four, five go by the weeks. So the fifth week, we started with game theory examples. Sixth week, um, we were sort of in the middle of doing like midterms. And then the seventh week, we moved into dynamic theory. And then in the eighth week, the lab was they had to come up with their own project. And so a little bit about that in a second. Uh, for the textbooks, um, for the Wolfram stuff, I, I, I picked this elementary book from Wolfram, which actually fits perfectly for the engineering students. I should have said at the beginning, these are juniors and seniors. And as engineering students, they've all had two years of calculus. They've had a, a variety of math courses. Um, often they've had discrete math and probability. So they, they, they know a fair amount. But this book taught them the Mathematica at a level that, that was, was like a common language. And then they could use their domain knowledge to go much further, which they did. 
For the game theory, um, I published a book on the dynamic theory last year, so I used that as the text. And then the structure of the notebook was we would have an, there was an initialization part, and um, they would provide a game matrix, and then it would produce the harmonic flows, and they could go, go from there. And what was kind of interesting was doing the midterm and uh, final using the notebook. I basically had a contract, I'd say, here, here's the notebook, when you're done, email it to me, and then come up and tell, and when I get the email, I'll write down that you sent it. So they were on their own to create their notebook, and they were pretty good about that. So there were some challenges. Um, interestingly enough, one of the first challenges is fear of calculus. <laughs> More generally, fear of mathematics. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have had that experience, but <laughs> uh, so I had to overcome that. The mixture of backgrounds, as I mentioned, and uh, the Mathematica approach really helped deal with those things. Um, so one of the first homework exercises was for them to, okay, take a game that's really trivial, like tic-tac-toe. <laughs> and I said, okay, how many of you know what the Solution is for what, how you should play the game. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, half the class knew how to do that. So I said, okay, the way you play the game is in an extensive form. Now, I want you to formulate it the way von Neumann and Morgenstern said you should do it as an intensive game, listing out all the strategies of what I do, what they do, what I do, what they do, until I get to the end. So they worked hard at it. This was a hard problem for them to do. Three or four people in the class realized, however, that if you went to Wolfram's natural language and typed in tic-tac-toe, <laughs> it had the answer to the homework. So there's the tic-tac-toe game, and here are all the strategies that are nicely laid out from, from the Wolfram language. So this, I got some converts, by the way, <laughs> at this point. They said, oh, okay, maybe this is not so crazy. So my goal was to bring students with all their different backgrounds. Um, clearly, by halfway through the course, some of the students were able to go beyond the simple game theory. And by the way, I had to build up game theory from scratch. It's not like I, it was a given. So I had to teach them all about game theory and Nash equilibrium. And I don't even guess that everybody here understands all of that. So. What were the deliverables? If I can say, click this. They had to get, um, in order to pass the course, they had to do the midterm and final, they had to do all the labs, and they had to get a good grade on it. And I graded them, by the way, on their style for their notebooks. So they actually had to do the a reasonable job on that. So fast forward, where did I get to by the end, OK? These are a, a, a list of the projects that they came up with. A, a number of them came up with variants of the, the game of chicken. Um, you, know, the chi you know, two cars <laughs> come at each other, and do you swerve or do you not swerve? Um, tragedy of the Commons. Uh, oh, some variation of a model that uh, is called work, wealth, and wisdom. Uh, there were people who were interested in baseball strategies, uh, football strategies, do you pass, do you not pass. Um, one of the most interesting ones, inventive ones, was an internet card trading game. <laughs> because the game is interesting, they're trading cards, but they were able to get the, trade the payoff matrix Using online stuff, these games are played massively with lots and lots of people, played over and over again. So they did a very good job of getting the raw data for that. So here's an example of the notebook that they had. They would have some initializations. By the way, they didn't have to go through and pull down this stuff. Um, it, but it was there if they wanted it. And in the course of the... Um, during the course of teaching them, 
they, they learned a lot of useful methods which then get, got incorporated into the um, useful methods category. But once it was there, they didn't have to go back to it. I gave them a whole host of games over the duration of the course. Oops. I don't want to do that. Come back. Um, I took games from a variety of sources, things that they gave me, uh, games from the Cold War, from the RAND Corporation. There are lots of books about game theory. So I uh, summarized uh, games, two strategies, 10 strategies, 20 strategies. They were all, all quite different. And go down. If they wanted, there was some background information that I was willing to give them. Occasionally, I would have to do um, a little bit of math teaching, so I'd have to remind them, what is the chain rule? Because <laughs> I was going to use it. Um, but I had that in the wings, but it was also part of their notebook. Um, told them, what is the essential point of the dynamic theory? I said, it's not Bayesian. It's looking for the shortest path. It's very different. And it's built on geometry, so every now and then I would have to say, oh, by the way, here's a whole bunch of stuff you need to know about geometry, <laughs> if you care. And if you don't care, well, you put this back up again. <laughs> um, so what did they have to do? First, their introduction to, get to a game was to, to describe it. They had to say, what's the game I'm going to do? So here was an example of the chicken game. Uh, it was, the student called it Econo Chicken. <laughs> and uh, so they said, OK, one aims to crash, one swerves. Uh, two, person two aims to crash, two swerves. Come up with a simple game matrix. Um, if you want to personalize some of the strings, you can do that. Then you had to specify a couple of things to get going, and then you could play with the couple of things. And so there was a, a, some pieces that you would have to play with the, basically the first couple of lines here, saying what kind of game it was. And then the next set of things were things that they had learned earlier about game theory so they could go back and replicate it, what they had learned. Then they would come down and say, the key issue here for the kind of dynamic game we're going to talk about is how you disrupt a, a, an equilibrium. So this part they would have to set out, and they would say, OK, we're going to disrupt it such and such a way, and then run the notebook. They might run the notebook multiple times. And the result usually was enough to get to this point. Um, what would be the basic change in time for the different strategies that you might play. So they would get to this part and they'd say, OK, blue is one aims to crash, uh, uh, green is one swerves. And you can see blue and green oscillate back and forth. So they have to sort of think through what does that all mean, and then write a little paragraph at the end. Then there were a number of other sections that they could go on and, and uh, think about. Uh, there were kind of hints of other ways of thinking about the problem. Um, but in the end, their piece was this thing at the bottom. They would have to write the paragraph about what does it all mean. In a 10-week course, there was a lot of stuff that I couldn't cover, but I did give like little culture lectures. Um, this part of game theory had essentially two different physical mechanisms. That once you got rid of the equilibrium, what was underneath it, what were the processes that determined it, what is essentially the payoff. Payoff is kind of like a magnetic field. Particles in a magnetic field can go straight, and you don't see anything interesting. But if you push a particle off and make it rotate, it will rotate based upon the strength of the magnetic field. So you, all of a sudden, you learn that the magnetic field wasn't just a direction, but it also had a strength. The other thing is. Uh, player valuations, which is a sort of analogy to an electric field, that things can have a bias. Somebody can bias you towards this direction or bias you towards that. There are, in fact, a number of other physical processes 
that might affect games. Some of them uh, sort of um, rational thinking, other things that are probably related to un irrational thinking, just uh, how people co uh, collaborate with each other. So I gave them some of that. Um, unfortunately, the, the mathematics got harder, which was OK, because I have a notebook. The first part of the mathematics, well, essentially, you had to solve uh, ordinary differential equation. For the, the more advanced stuff, you had to solve partial differential equations that are nonlinear. So this section would set up how you do the, would just set up for them without going into what they were doing. And then you could iterate your uh, nonlinear differential equation multiple times, and it would nicely converge to an answer. So if they did that, um, they would get an answer, or I would do it for them as part of the culture. And there are, in fact, other things that you can also do, which is we just talked about disruptions, which are essentially in space. But you can have disruptions in time, like in electrical engineering, where you have an impulse, right? And then things oscillate as a function of that impulse in time. So you can do exactly the same thing here. So there was a whole section on that. So what did I learn from all this? Um, I started off with a computational approach to game theory. So one of my conclusions was I should probably not be shy, but it was a computational approach to how you make decisions. So it's more general than game theory. That's the part that was new. Um, focusing on games and their harmonic behavior was, in fact, the right thing to do. It really, quote, resonated with the students. And um, I had a list of things which I, I learned if I taught the course again, I would probably change, OK? Uh, some technical things about how I approach game theory, I would probably change. Um, I was naive in some of my thinking about what sorts of behavior is harmonic, because the theory has more kinds of harmonic behavior in it than I had first thought about. But they kept coming with solutions that behaved in a way that I didn't expect. And I went, oh, but actually, that's quite correct. This is actually how it should go. So I would put, build that into the, st the start. Um, the chicken game was very interesting. And I learned from that, that this is a really profound issue in game theory. When you have two different Nash equilibria, there's not a nice way in game theory to combine them. And the dynamic theory has a rather nice way and shows you can combine them all kinds of different ways. And I would probably emphasize that a lot more about how, in a, like in a game of chicken, these two distinct Nash equilibria end up combining and how you can go from, even though I think I'm going to go straight and he swerves, what I end up doing in some solutions is I always swerve, nevertheless. <laughs> in other words, I, it's counterintuitive. So I do a better job on that. Um, the exercises I gave, both the Mathematica exercise and the game theory exercises, do, keeping it at a low level was really useful because that allowed everybody to keep up. And nobody really got behind in this course, believe it or not, even though, if, if you think about it, the math was way beyond what they remembered. They'd all had been exposed to some of this stuff. But if I asked them, you know, what is dy dx equals zero, what's the solution to that, I might not get an answer. <laughs> so. But Mathematica gave them an answer, and then we go, oh, yeah, yeah, right, I get it. Um, the quarter system is good and bad. That was another issue. Um, I, I would love to teach maybe a two-quarter system on this, although the quarter system is good in the sense that it <laughs> keeps you moving. So we got to the end of the course, and they learned an awful lot before they realized they had learned an awful lot. <laughs> and then if I had taught a second course, I would probably then be, uh, work more on uh, projects that they could come up with and, and then dive a little bit deeper into some of the mechanisms that might occur to them um, that might be applicable to these hard, um, more complicated things. So um, I, I think in st strict time, I usually try to keep my time pretty accurate. I think I'm exactly at 20, right? <laughs> teaching then. <laughs> um, so I'd be really happy to take questions if anybody has. And I apologize, I didn't, you know, 
show you an awful lot of the stuff in the notebook, but you can download it. There's, I did a lot of calculations in the notebook for them. <laughs> and so there's a lot of stuff. And some of the calculations use simple Wolfram language and some of uh, sort of arcane kinds of constructions with at, at, and all that kind of stuff. So I'd be happy to introduce questions. Uh, I, I, I thought about how to take this to the next step. And I, I, I'm talking to people at Wolfram about how ma maybe to make this notebook, you know, like a book. <laughs> or, and if not, then I would really, you know, it would be fun to, t to make the course available. But yeah, why don't we talk afterwards? I will follow up with that. Um, well, I gave the course in the spring, so you might think I don't have an awful lot of time. But I, um, right after the course, uh, I got a request from one of my students from that course to write a letter of recommendation to various graduate schools <laughs> because he now wants to go into robotics and use decision theory as, as part of his interest in robotics. So he connected the dots. Yes. Can you tell me what the role of experimental data was? Because obviously you didn't have experimental data. No. First, let me, let's see if I can back up and find it quickly. Oops, initializations. Oops. So this matrix at the bottom was called modern meta. That was the input for the utility for playing these different strategies. These numbers, 0 0.05, 0 0.07, these are the numbers, the utility numbers that he got by looking at um, massive uh, numbers of games being played on the internet that was available to him. So this is where the input numbers came in. And then based upon this, he was then he then created um, the, the game matrix. He created the other pieces of the model. Then he created a, okay, let's try a disruption where people take a strategy that everybody who plays trading games knows is not really the optimal strategy, tier two strategy. And then he would say, well, gosh, the tier two strategy goes up. But as it goes up, the, the tier one strategy starts coming back and they start trading places. And so he was able to make some conclusions. Um, he had a little bit of difficulty about getting the actual numbers because it, some of it was proprietary and the, the owners of the game kind of made it difficult to find, but he was still able to, to pull out some of the most interesting numbers. I hope that answers your question. Oh, sorry. Right. Yes. It sounds like game, the game theory avenue is not as interesting as the decision theory. Correct. How would you explore more of the decision theory? Um, because there are more mechanisms in decision theory. Let, as an ex let me give a physics example because it's easy because the game theory is, gets brief. Okay. I can have a car on a road, right? And, and I simply pay attention to the fact that it moves at a certain speed in a certain direction. I don't necessarily have to take into account the fact that it's on the road and it's not falling through the road, <laughs> all right? So there's a big thing in physics where you identify what are the active things that you want to talk about, what are the inactive things that you don't necessarily want to talk about, but you need to know how much energy they take away from you, right? So a um, couple of the areas that I talked about, like the idea of ownership, introduces something like a, a force or a pressure. 
these don't have to do with the people playing the game as much as all the people that you're ignoring. <laughs> so you have to take into account those external forces. You have to take into account the fact that people can collaborate, okay? And these forces are not harmonic payoff forces. They're sort of gradient forces where they just glom together. And they can form collaborations or they cannot. So I'd like to explore how those things work in a theoretical model where you're just taking the shortest path but allowing all the forces to operate in a controlled way where you say, let's add this force, let's see what happens. Let's add that force, let's see what happens. Okay, well, thank you very much.